Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Impact Week faculty lecture, ESG and Supply Chains, Uncovering the Blind Spots. This event is brought to you by UCLA Anderson Center for Impact, uh, the Anderson Center for Global Management, and the MBA Net Impact Club, and the CFA Society of LA. My name is Bhavna Sivanand. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Impact. And at our center, our objectives are to integrate the competencies of social impact and sustainability into fundamental business education, engage more closely with UCLA faculty and their research across disciplines to determine criteria for impact measurement and corporate performance, and to disseminate and advance these priorities to help firms, investors, consumers, and other stakeholders make decisions that are better for people and the planet. Such metrics will be particularly valuable in the post-COVID-19 economic context as we continue to evaluate corporations through an environment, social, and governance lens. In recent years, we've seen environmental, social, and governance-focused investing's dramatic expansion as investors increasingly seek out opportunities to leave a positive mark on society. At the same time, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to light major blind spots in the performance and resilience of supply chains worldwide. Through today's lecture, we'll explore the ongoing challenges in supply chain transparency while learning about cutting edge research on the impact of supply chains on ESG ratings. So with that, I'd now like to introduce Professor Chris Tang, who is UCLA's distinguished professor, has an Edward W. Carter Chair in Business Administration, is a Senior Associate Dean of Global Initiatives and also the Faculty Director for the Center for Global Management. A foremost scholar of global supply chain management, Chris Tang focuses his research on social innovation in developing countries, identifying how companies operate in the environment to do good while doing well at the same time. In his words, where corporate responsibility, social justice, and, and, and environmental stewardship can go hand in hand. Tang's interest in this field began in the private sector where he worked for IBM to solve international production planning problems. Exposure to real life industry projects motivated his academic research where he developed teaching cases on a variety of concerns such as microfinancing for the poor, mobile platforms for developing economies, creating shared values and direct procurement of agricultural products, response management in disasters and new business models in the age of the internet. These cases exceeded the traditional topics of operations management, addressing the trendy and pressing issues faced by supply chain executives, as well as innovations that industry leaders used to create higher values in the global market. Chris Tang is world renowned in the field of global supply chain management, has been a consultant to numerous corporations such as Amazon, HP, IBM, Nestle, and Accenture. He's taught courses at Stanford, UC Berkeley, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, National University of Singapore, MIT, and London Business School, and served as a visiting professor at Cambridge and the Institute of Advanced Study at HQUST. He has delivered more than 200 keynote speeches and seminars at conferences and universities worldwide, and we are so excited to have him with us here today to share his insights on ESG and supply chains. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Professor Chris Tang. Thank you, Bhavna. Uh, hello, everyone. So let me just share the screen with you. Okay, thank you for having me. And today I'm delighted to have this opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, ESG and supply chain management thinking. Now, before I start, I want to uh, clarify one thing. I'm no expert in this field because this is a changing field is evolving. Uh, actually, no one knows how the future holds because there are many stakeholders, there are many uh, issues involving ESG and supply chain. So, but I would like to share with you about what I have observed, what I've read, what I know with you, and hopefully that we can have a, a fruitful discussion later on, all right? So, so what I'm gonna talk about today is we're gonna talk about how ESG came about. And also that's now there's a new movement about ESG investing. Then the question is, is it a good solution? Is it creating new problem? I don't know. So, and also we talk about different challenges and opportunities, and then I conclude, then we'll open up for discussion. Now, in terms of the shareholder value that started in 1970, companies were thinking about making money and also for the shareholders. 
and then while conforming the rules of the law, uh, which makes sense. But then the question is that is, would that work? Now, this idea of shareholder is also consistent with Adam Smith claim that when firms are in pursuit of uh, profits, they are led by an invisible hand that would actually lead them to do what is the best for the world. That is conceptual thinking, seems to make sense because the market, the free market will correct itself. But then we observe that it's not quite clear that it is happening. We have seen that uh, different scandals uh, between uh, the uh, Volkswagen, the diesel gates issues uh, to uh, BP, the uh, Deep Horizon water scandal, and also the collapse of Radna Plaza in Bangladesh in 2013, when they're making the Walmart products. Then during the COVID pandemic, there were problems because a lot of retailers, uh, they had to cancel the orders or postpone the orders because uh, all the stores were shut. So, but then they were accused for not paying the wages of the contract manufacturers. So the workers, they felt that they have been uh, subjected to wage theft close to over $500 million. Then the question is that is, uh, if this shareholder value does not work, how about we expand the value system from shareholder to stakeholder? Well, in 1980, uh, Edward Freeman at Stanford did also talk about the CSR defined by stakeholders that would encompass different measures. But then the question will work. Well, after over close to 40 years, uh, there's an article in Harvard uh, Business Review claiming that it doesn't work. Uh, there are many reasons. The two key reasons are, one, consumers are not willing to pay for companies, actually, they do good in all elements, point number one. Point number two is that quite often, uh, it is not well defined because there's so many measurements, which one is the right one? So in the case, that was a uh, somewhat a, a disappointment. But then the question, what else can we do? Well, that pivot from CSR to ESG, that stands for Environment, Social and Governance. Now, but then the key difference is the following. The CSR is pushing for companies to become more accountable about their actions. ESG is a well, try to develop measures, try to develop measurable actions, measurable outcomes, such that we'll try to identify which companies are actually doing the right thing. Right? So this movement, movement started by the United Nations when they asked companies to report or disclose about their activities. Now, then the question is why? Why do we do consider ESG? Well, we already talked about the mind, uh, sh the shift in the value system and the metric from uh, shareholder to stakeholder to ESG. Now, but then there's a mindset shift. Over the last 20 years, especially younger generations, they worry about sustainability, carbon emissions, greenhouse gas, uh, uh, income inequality, and also fairness, and all these issues. But then the younger generation said, well, we need to have power to nudge or to, uh, to uh, encourage or to push companies to do well. So therefore, ESG is formed as a ESG measures will empower investors. They will try to nudge and push companies to do right. Now, this movement is creating some change in the executive mindset. Let me share with you about a study conducted by McKinsey in 2020, all right? So McKinsey conducted this survey and they're asking executives in terms of what do they think about ESG? Now you look at uh, the, uh, the range, they all actually going up. In 2009, uh, this is maybe, uh, maybe 13 years ago, uh, I think of the percentage of companies think that they create long-term with short-term value were lower. But then this is promising. Now, most uh, executives, they feel that this actually ESG can create uh, long-term and short-term value. You see the slope on every single dimension is moving up. So that is encouraging. Now, but then the question, what kind of value would ESG create in the mind of the executives? 
So what McKinsey found out is the following. They found out that is, there is also a change in mindset from the executive perspective. If you can see the decline on the uh, left-hand side, you can see that it's actually, they feel that ESG is not really about creating a good brand image, not that much. But on the right-hand side, you can see the big increase. They talk about in terms of uh, how ESG can improve the company's competitive position and also to improve the access to capital, meaning investment, right? So that means that now using the ESG investments, actually uh, the executives care about that because they need capital and also can improve the competitive position because all these measures will become more public. Now, but then this is really a consistent with the, the trend of uh, ESG investment. Now, in uh, 2021, the global asset managed in the DSG portfolio. This is asset under management. This includes your retirement fund that includes some kind of index fund. Altogether, it's around $35 trillion. Well, but actually, in a few years' time, it become even bigger. In the, by 2025, Bloomberg estimated it could actually go up to $53 trillion. Wow, this is a huge number, right? So you can see that this is really a very promising trend. So that means that as more investors, they want to invest in companies uh, that would do good. Uh, hopefully, they also do well. Now, when you have so much money involved, then they, and that means that you also attract more people, more companies to create uh, different uh, measures, different capabilities to help investors to make the right investment decisions. Well, in this case, we see that there is a floodgate open. Many companies come in to do this kind of ESG ratings and also using different type of data collection and AI, big data analytics. Now, the major one is that is the, the biggest one is MSCI, which is the oldest uh, ESG uh, firm that can do collect data and also analyze data to give you the rating. The next one is uh, uh, Bloomberg, and then the Sustain Analytics, which is owned by uh, Morningstar. And then the next one is Refinitiv, which is owned by the London Stock Exchange. On the right-hand side, these are the companies, they do big data analytics, and as well as other uh, companies, and then the ratings. But then the question is that is, uh, when you have so many ratings, it become like the business school ratings. That could uh, be a bit overwhelming, right? Now, when you have so many ratings, then the question is that is, would they be uh, consistent? Well, there are some challenges. If you look at these two ratings, the one on the left, uh, they have uh, companies such as uh, the French company Snyder Electric, from one year so rated 29 and then ranked number one the next year. Well, I don't know. Uh, what does it really mean? On the right-hand side is they talk about most of the companies that rank well. Those are the uh, uh, software development or uh, uh, chemical, but then there's a mixed bag, mixed type of industry. Then the question is, what does it really mean? So that also creates some kind of uh, confusion, uh, you, if you will. All right. Now, but then because there's so many rating agencies and also companies feel that there is a uh, obligations, the pressure to disclose different things, then who is going to collect the data? Who is going to analyze the data? Who, how is this data going to be reported or disclosed or even audited? Well, that creates a huge, huge explosion of jobs, especially in the MBA program. So PwC is going to spend $12 billion to hire 100,000 people in five years to push for this kind of ESG measurements. And then on the right-hand side, talk about business school and also job market is hot. Now, then the question is that is, is this going to be a solution to make company do good or would that create new problems that we do not know, right? So, well, time will tell. Now, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna share with you that I want to observe the six challenges that would create maybe new opportunities for us to consider, right? So ESG, there are many challenges. Let me first start with the first one. The first one is that, well, 
even the business school ranking is very overwhelming, but GSG measurement is also overwhelming. There are not 79 measures, right? So if you're executives, if you're the executive board, how do you figure out what is the right thing to do? They're all important, of course. So for example, environmental factors, those are easy to measure, like uh, greenhouse gas, uh, CO2 emissions and whatnot. Now social, the S pillar is a little bit nebulous. It could be in terms of employee uh, satisfaction, uh, in terms of working conditions, uh, in terms of customer satisfaction, in terms of human rights and other things. The governance, uh, the pillar, the, the last one, it talk about maybe DEI, diversity of the board members, and also how transparent are you? Do you have independent uh, board members? But then when you have 79 measures, this could create uh, major challenges for companies even to think about how to manage and how to collect data, how to respond to all these measurements, right? Now, this is challenge number one. Challenge number two, when you have so many ratings, well, then the question is, they are measuring the elephants from a different perspective. Then the question, are they consistent? Are they uh, meaningful, right? So, well, the chart on the uh, left-hand side, it shows that the ratings of uh, Sustainable Analytics and MSCI, uh, well, you run the linear regression, the R square is 0 0.32. That means the correlation is on around 0 0.3. This is not so high. Now, on the right-hand side, it's also talk about the MSCI in terms of how they value the company, the rating, versus the FUSI in London, how they value the companies. Again, you can see that it's over the map. So when it's not so consistent, then investors could get confused, right? So this is create another confusion. Uh, which rating do you believe in? So that remains to be seen. So this is challenge number two. Then moving on to challenge number three. Challenge number three is about uh, the missing link in the supply chain. Now, when you talk about uh, the E pillar, the environmental issue pillar, so there are companies that are supposed to disclose the uh, carbon uh, dioxide emission, all right? Now, there are three different scale. The first one is scope one. You report your carbon emissions within your company. Scope two is about uh, the indirect emissions from your utility supply. So like uh, trucks or refineries or electricity you use. Scope three is that this, all the emissions is not captured in a company, but is also upstream from your supply chain or downstream from your supply chain. Now, then we discover that only 19% of the manufacturing companies disclose scope three emissions. Well, there are three scopes. They did not disclose those. Is it a big deal or not? Well, as it turns out, most of the carbon emissions, they are generated from scope three. As in particular, for US firms, when they outsource so much, so in the case, actually within the four walls, the emission is not that high. So in the case, is this part of greenwashing? All right, so that remains to be uh, is a discussion uh, we can have, right? So most of the time, the biggest uh, culprit is not reported. Then in the case, what does the measure mean, right? What does this measurement mean, right? So let me use one example to illustrate my point, all right? Let's take... Uh, the case of Amazon. Amazon is the most favorite holding by many, many ESG funds, including Vanguard, including others. Then Refinitiv, as mentioned, is a rating agencies that is a subsidiary of the London Stock Exchange. You look at Amazon, everything looks good. You look at the rating, is everything is AAAA, right? So A plus is highest. Now, so if you look at this rating uh, for uh, Refinitiv, they, uh, they actually, they weight uh, uh, environmental issues around 30%, as you see now. But then we, we break it down from the, the environmental pillar, the A will go further down. It goes further down is actually, they measure the emissions uh, based on the weight 12.7%. And that one the emissions together A plus. It's a wow, this is fantastic. Is Amazon doing the, the great thing? Well, you think about it, in terms of revenue, Amazon is bigger than Walmart, but they claim that in the report, they claim that the shipping emissions is only one seventh of Walmart. 
Well, depending how you count it, right? If you only count only uh, what Amazon's involved in the scope one, it may be true. But then you do not count for those uh, merchandise sold by the third party sellers. They ship it from other countries like China, and uh, they can only track a small fractions of the shipments from other countries. So in the case of shipment and trucks and all this. So in the case, actually, we're not seeing the whole elephant. So therefore, this kind of measurements can be misleading. All right. So let me just conclude the challenge of linking this ESG with the supply chain. Now, we know the supply chain op uh, operations are omnipresent. Every company has supply chains. But then if you don't really incorporate what the suppliers upstreams or downstreams are doing in the context ESG, then the measurements can be misleading. Now, then the question is that is, uh, and in particular, in many cases, the suppliers is actually involved in the major issues of ESG. So for example, deforestation uh, due to palm oil in the Indonesia, the collapse of Rana Plaza in Bangladesh, and also forced labor, right? So in the case, if we don't ignore all those factors, then the question is that is how can we hold companies be accountable if they actually subcontract or contract it out some of the dirty work to other suppliers upstream and downstream? But then the question, how do we get company to uh, disclose this kind of data? Well, not so simple. Uh, based on the study, uh, a lot of companies, they said that they cannot really uh, find the data, the, the data are insufficient. And also that they are not so sure how to analyze this kind of data and all this. So that remains to be seen. Maybe NGO can help out. So this is challenge number four. Now, let me talk about uh, the LA issues because I know this impact week is about Los Angeles. So I'm going to talk about challenge number five, all right? Challenge number five is who is responsible for uh, carbon emissions? Uh, take uh, Los Angeles and Long, Long Beach, the port, for instance. If you look at the, the blue the curve, it's about the emissions from April to September in 2020, that's during the COVID area. And then 2021, last year, actually went up. In particular, to the year end, we know that the, the port were congested uh, because of so many ships. But then the question is, who is responsible, right? Is it the port? The port said, that, well, uh, the, 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 the trucking company are not claiming the containers. So in the case, we have all this ship delay. Is it the terminal operators? Then they say, well, it's actually not exactly because that's, uh, they cannot get the, the container clear up. Then there's nothing they can do. Is it the ocean freight operators like Maersk? Then they say, oh, hey, the, the port is not moving fast enough. So who is responsible? Now, then the question is that is, uh, there is a claim that the LA port facilities will become emission three by 2035. But then unless we can sort this out, uh, I don't know how this is going to, to change, right? Now, we have not seen the worst yet because of the lockdown in Shanghai, there are around 500 container ships, they're stuck there. Once China opened up, all these ships, many ships will come to the West Coast. So in the case, we'll see another tsunami coming our way uh, later on this year. So in the case, uh, the, uh, the issues in Los Angeles, how do we resolve this, is not exactly done by a single party. So it required uh, coordination and communication and collaboration among all the parties along the supply chain. But then the question is, who can kickstart all this movement, right? So I don't know, right? So that's challenge number five. Now, challenge number six, well, there are a lot of money we invested to uh, support uh, the ESG investment, right? But then are they doing well or not? Well, the jury is still out. Uh, this is a study. Uh, as uh, actually also happened in the MIT study uh, this year in 2022, they found exactly the same finding. So in this slide, you talk about in terms of how to compare the performance of different index funds against the Standard Poor 500 index fund. So that means that, hey, I, I don't know what's going on. I just invest in the, uh, the just an index fund. 
this S&P 500 index. So the benchmark is horizontal line, the zero, right? So that means I just do that. Versus the other ESG index fund, by and large, sometimes it's better, sometimes lower, but then you account for the superior performance of the S&P 500 last year, ESG is not performing well at all. So there is a Barron's article talk about these issues. Now, then the question is why? Well, there are many reasons. So researchers, finance professors, and accounting professors are investigating that. Uh, first of all, uh, one claim that is, well, because that uh, these uh, companies, they are doing well. If they're doing well, then the, 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 the market price, the stock price is already high because everyone is already investing in it. So therefore, the potential to move up even higher is less. So therefore, they cannot beat the S&P 500 because it's or the stock price already factored in into the original stock price. So therefore, uh, it's an, not, not reasonable for, for you to expect to perform better, right? That's point number one. Point number two is that there is also uh, barons. They have uh, researchers. They discover that it may be the case that uh, uh, when the index funds focus on all these ESG-focused companies, then the portfolio is much more limited. So, for example, uh, maybe for oil and gas companies, they already excluded it, right? So, therefore, right now, the oil and gas companies are doing very well because of the war in Ukraine. Also, uh, they may also exclude uh, companies that make weapons, like the defense company, like uh, Northrop Grumman or uh, some other uh, defense companies. But And yet now the stock price went up to the roof because uh, of the war in Ukraine. And also some of the uh, mining companies, they do uh, extract uh, uh, minerals or, or metals but then uh, this is considered dirty uh, uh, companies. It's also excluded by the ESG index fund. And yet right now, because that uh, we need more electric vehicles, we want more lithium, we need uh, more materials to make the, the semiconductors. So those stock prices are also going up as well. So relatively speaking, if you excluded all those companies in your ESG index, you may end up with a uh, uh, maybe the performance, the stock performance may not be as good. But then let's also come back to the original questions. Why do uh, investors invest in ESG index fund? You want the company to do good or you want to, the company to do well or you want to do both, right? So in that case, the question is, that are we asking the right questions? Are we expecting all this index fund to beat all the marketplace? Right. So what is intention? So I, I, don't, I don't know. So I think that is something we need to sort this out. But time will tell. Then the next one is that is, there are opportunities to rethink uh, all these challenges, given those challenge, uh, six challenges. First of all, right now, uh, in terms of supply chain visibility, transparencies are low. Many companies do not really know the identity of their suppliers beyond tier one. Of course, they know tier one because they need to issue the check to pay for the, uh, for the invoice for ordering things. But beyond that is they either they don't know or they don't care, right? So that in the case, without the supply chain visibility, so they don't really know whether the ESG along the supply chain is clean, is also a responsible, uh, well-governed, or not, they don't know, right? Then, but I think that maybe we can learn from the fashion industry. Fashion industry has been accused of being dirty. So in the case right now, uh, the fashion industry, they do have a fashion transparency index. So in that case, how uh, transparent are, are you in terms of where you source the materials, uh, the percentage of female workforce in the factories and the pay scale and whatnot, right? So in the case, that may help in terms of getting the visibility at first. Because without the visibility and transparency, you cannot measure in terms of what the supplies are doing upstream or downstream. So point number one. Point number two is that is right now, I think that the ESG measures are, are, are too overwhelming. 79 measures, it's just uh, too complicated. And then I think they will generate fatigue uh, at best. 
But then, actually, if it's not careful, actually generates incentives for greenwashing to cover up the dirt, right? So therefore, we need to make it easy to measure and also to be consistent across different rating agencies. Right now, different rating agencies, they have their own secret formula, the secret sauce, because the algorithm is not disclosed. So in that case, you don't know how they use those uh, data to come up with the rating. Now, then the third one is uh, we also need to make sure that the data they submitted by the company or uh, they acquire from external sources can be verifiable. Right now, uh, the SEC uh, in the US uh, actually uh, does not really have a easy mechanism to do that. Right now, the data is actually is uh, self-reporting and also self-certified, the company certified themselves. Then the case uh, without uh, uh, audits, uh, that could be a complicated uh, matter. So in that case, I think that's in the future, I think that there should be some kind of external audits would be necessary. So therefore that may create so many jobs for PwC for, to do that. And then the last one is that this, we also need to understand about uh, the investors uh, original intentions. As I mentioned before, you want them to do good or do well, or what is exactly the intentions? Because you want to support company to do good, but then maybe you sacrifice a little bit of uh, your investment return. Is it okay or not? I don't know, right? So I think that is something we need to understand as well. All right. So let me conclude, then we can open up for uh, further discussions. All right. So what we find is that this uh, ESG is the talk of the town, uh, because I've, again, I've uh, given uh, a few talks uh, in different places, and also there are many articles uh, in the newspaper, in the press, and the finance, accounting, they really studying this uh, 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 very uh, uh, frequently. And also that's right now because of ESG investing, and also that's create uh, opportunities for companies to re-examine the way they manage the ESG activities, right? That will also create uh, consulting opportunities for firms to help firms how to navigate through this uh, new, new era in terms of how should they actually uh, do good and do well. And also that we also discuss uh, the issue of missing link because they only, most of the firms they only disclose scope one emissions, but then scope three is missing. But And yet we know that most of the dirty activities that happen further upstream in the mining uh, area, maybe conflict minerals, maybe uh, not an ethical practice that we do not know. Then the question is, how can we eliminate this kind of greenwashing activities? Then the last but not least, then the question, there's a big debate. Should there be a uh, regulatory body to make sure that companies, they do uh, the disclosure, uh, the reporting and the data integrity in a consistent manner, right? So I think right now, SEC is coming up with some measures uh, by the, the end of this year. So I, I do not know all the details yet, right? So this is uh, what I have. And then uh, I guess I want to thank you for your time. And then we're going to open for discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Professor Tang, for your insightful presentation. Um, I think it's it's a fascinating topic. And I think, you know, there's, uh, thank you for kind of presenting it in a way that levels the playing field a little bit, because I think people's level of knowledge on this is is varied. Um, there, I wanted to start off with a couple of questions, and then I'll take a look at um, the audience Q&A. Um, one question was, do you have any thoughts on how companies can create um, visibility for their investors into some of the social and environmental factors associated with their supply chains? Are there um, are there ways you know that that are more creative than sort of through the traditional metrics right now that companies can kind of open up the books on their supply chains to investors? Well, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, right now there are a lot of. Uh, uh, rating agencies, they can report these kind of measures. Then, for example, you go to all these rating agencies, you can search for different firms about the ratings. Also, even Yahoo Finance, 
if you go to Yahoo Finance webpage, you click on the firm, they also report the user MSCI index. You click it, you can actually check it down. So that's one. Secondly, I think that right now, I think that in the, maybe I can talk about the, the, uh, the pillar of the G, the governance, about in terms of diversity, inclusion, uh, and equity. Uh, so now many firms, uh, more progressive firms, uh, they do report this kind of measurements in terms of uh, career uh, uh, advancements for the different minority groups, uh, female, and also in terms of percentage of minorities and female on the board. So they do have that kind of measurements as well. So, but then the question is, that, is by the companies themselves are not sure by doing all this, does it really help? That remains to be seen. Then it's okay, you want me to do good, I'm doing, doing good. But are the investors, are the consumers going to reward me? Because if we do not reward the company, truly pull out our wallets, open our wallets to support these companies, they cannot survive. So I think now it's become a chicken and egg problem, right? So we don't trust the companies and the companies actually do not trust us. Right. So I think it's a chicken egg problem. But then the question, how can we break this cycle such that we truly can uh, uh, truly b believe what we actually do to reward companies and the companies so truly believe that if they do good, they will be rewarded. So I think that is a chicken and egg problem. So I think that is something uh, we have not solved yet. Right. And in terms of your, your comment, you know, kind of bringing us to the, the Rana Plaza collapse, factory, factory collapse, um, have there been any changes in sort of um, end of the, the, the supply chain metrics that are connecting back to the S and the G for ESG um, in terms of how companies are evaluated on their supply chains on the social metrics of factories? Yes, thank you. This is a great question. Uh, I have uh, written articles on that uh, because I do this kind of social innovations. So after the Renault Plaza collapse, collapse in 2013, uh, over a thousand workers uh, were killed because the, uh, the factories, the building was not safe. And even before the fire, fire hazards it has killed a lot of uh, factory workers because the factory owners uh, locked the gates to make sure that the, the workers, they work so many hours. Now, since the collapse, uh, a lot of uh, international brands, they had to make a conscious decisions. So they pull out to avoid uh, collateral damage, or they stay behind to work with Bangladesh to make sure that uh, they can, uh, the work, uh, working conditions are safe, right? So, uh, many companies, uh, as well European companies, they form a consortium. They call a court. Uh, for the, it's really to try to make sure that all this uh, building up to code and also safety measures are being taken seriously. So they do independent audits. So that measurement was very successful. Uh, they signed in the court. They share the costs to help all these factories to build up to code. Then they said that we invest money, but then we will do the audit. Now, if they find that the audits is not, uh, that uh, the factory did not comply with the international standards, all members will pull out. So that means that this factory will go bankrupt. They use this kind of harsh penalty. So in their case to enforce that. Since 2013, we've seen a lot of progress. So that's why that recently you have not seen too many disasters happening in Bangladesh. So that is a good thing. But then the question is that, is it sustainable? Because it costs money. So last year, some members, they have uh, little second thoughts. Then they said, well, we invest so much money for close to 10 years. Uh, yes, maybe they save it now, but the cost going up. But then the question is, is it really a good investment or not? Right. So therefore, if the public knows more about this and more so also more willing to support this and willing to pay a bit more, just like the CSR I mentioned earlier on, hey, you want people to do good, but you don't want to, to reward them, then how can they survive? Because the costs go up more, just like the, the, the fair price uh, when you drink uh, uh, Starbucks coffee. It's more expensive because they do pay the farmers a fair price, right? So I think that is really something uh, the, 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 the brands and the consumers need to have a agreement 
that is uh, mutually agreeable, this is the right thing to do. In that case, uh, both sides will not break the, the commitment. That will help. But I think that Bangladesh, we have seen a lot of progress. Thank you. And that actually brings me to one more question I have before I look at um, the audience question. And it's, um, so you bring up a point about the difference in standards, um, you know, uh, in developed countries versus emerging economies. So how should investors think about supply chain standards in developed versus emerging economies? And how does that link back to ESG measures? Uh, that's very good questions. Uh, I think that in the, I think that different countries, they now doing different measures. So right now, I think that in the developed economies, uh, such as US, Europe, and they have each country, they have their own measurements. Uh, now, but I think in Asia, in particular in China or Korea, now they develop their own as well. So I think that that's where we need to come up with the international body to make sure that this, the standards is established in, uh, in developing countries is uh, in cons either consistent or congruent with the US or European measures. So this would be like our uh, electric uh, appliances, uh, when you have the uh, UL underwriters uh, certified uh, products, that means even, even though the products make in Asia, but it comply with the US standard. In Europe, it's CE, right? So I think that this is uh, under discussion right now. So now there is a, a body, it's called ISSB, International Sustainability Standard Board. It trying to see is there any way to develop a international standards such that you do not need to uh, really get certification in different countries, right? So hopefully uh, in the future, we can actually come up with some form of standards like the financial reporting standards, such that would be ESG would be more uh, uh, consistent uh, around the world. We are not there yet. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I'm going to turn to some of the audience questions. Um, a popular question is anything that you might have, um, any reflections or thoughts about how UCLA is doing in terms of ESG, um, in terms of its own divestments or investments, in terms of the UC pension, and so there seems to be some, some questions there. Um, I don't know if you have some comments on that. Okay, uh, I do not know the details, but I do know that there is uh, being discussed in terms of how ESG should actually invest in all these funds. Uh, but then in terms of schools, now uh, the Anderson School, now we have at least two courses focusing on ESG. So I think if the student are interested in that, one of them is co-taught with uh, Henry Friedman uh, from, uh, from the accounting uh, department. So I think that this is a really hot topic uh, not just companies, even you said they do discuss it, but I'm not on the board of the uh, investment of the uh, pension funds. So that is above my pay scale, but that is uh, somewhere the UC office uh, would look into it. But I think that I can assure you that they do consider that. Right. Um, and then you had talked about sort of the, 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 the movement from CSR to ESG is one about moving from accountability to measurement. And the question here is, um, but doesn't one need to measure to be accountable? So they seem to be related accountability and measurement. Um, and so if you have any more thoughts on that. Well, uh, yes, uh, before is more philosophical, the CSR. That means that you need to be kind to people, you need to be nice to people, but then it's well, how do you define kind? How do you define politeness, right? Mm -hmm. I think that that is where the, CSR was kind of, is it good to have a, uh, uh, the, the, the philosophy, but then how do you actually execute, implement it? So that was uh, part of the reasons why is the, CHG, uh, the CSR movement kind of plateau and then kind of fizzles out, right? So now I think that now people say, well, if you, you, if you tell me you're doing good, prove it to me. Right. So I think that is where the ESG measurability comes into play, because it's everyone says, of course, I, I, I'm clean, I, I'm green, I'm clean, I, I'm good to everyone. But then so while everyone says that it doesn't mean anything. If you look at uh, CSR before, every single companies, they have a separate uh, department. They generally report uh, in terms of, uh, OK, so our employees, they go to uh, have uh, some kind of community events, they do donate money and all this, uh, fine.
but then it's not part of the DNA. So right now, the ESG is pushing companies to embed it, all these activities into the actual activities rather than it's a separate reporting system. So, and also make it a, a measurable. Once it's measurable, at least then in that case, would you have a, a more uh, uh, made more bite to it. Just like the business school. Before we did not have the business school ranking, that everyone's, of course, they declared it the best, right? So right now, you can argue what is a good measure, what is the right measure or not, but at least the information is there. Mm -hmm. That whole adage of you can't change what you can't measure, or you can't improve upon what you don't measure, exactly. Exactly. Uh, and then um, the final question is, do you see more benefits being given by the SEC for using verified data versus CSR alone? Okay. Uh, in terms of SEC right now, they have not really come down with a definitive uh, 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 requirement. Uh, as of now, uh, the data is uh, self-disclosed, self-reporting and self-certified. And we know that that is uh, really questionable, right? That's the whole point. We want measurable outcomes, measurable actions. So therefore, I think SEC is moving towards in some form of uh, 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 in terms of uh, uh, mandatory disclosure. Uh, it's not come down yet. So I think that is one element because CSR alone is not measurable. As you point out, Bafna, you cannot get the improvement unless it's measurable. Otherwise, it's very difficult, right? Then the question, are we measuring right thing? I do not know, but at least you need to start somewhere, right? So uh, uh, we need to start from somewhere. So hopefully this movement We'll get there eventually. We're not there yet. That's why it's so exciting. Yeah. Well, um, thank you so much, Professor Professor Tang. I um, I want, on behalf of the the whole school and the Center for Impact, and I actually am just planning on bringing um, Maggie as well um, to to thank you. But I just want to, in, in closing remarks, I just want to say um, this presentation is great, and it's you know more discussions about ESG and and what that means from a business school perspective and how business students can get involved in that is is warranted. So us at the Center for Impact, we're definitely working towards supporting more content and curriculum on that. I wanted to thank the Center for Global Management for being such a great partner with us to shape multiple conversations about corporate sustainability and impact across the world. I also want to thank the CFA Society of LA for being a thought and promotional partner with us on this event. And for those of you that want to learn more about this topic, the CFA Society of LA offers a certificate in ESG investing that I encourage you to explore. Um, and please check out the rest of the events this week for Impact Week happening in person. And Professor Delmas, do you have uh, any final thoughts or questions? I just wanted to, you know, thank you very much, both of you. Thank you uh, very much, Professor Tang, for uh, a very um, comprehensive description of the, you know, ESG um, challenges, uh, you know, and, and as they relate to supply chain. So thank you so much. Uh, and then to, to, to kind of lead the discussion and, and the, you know, the research in this area. And thank you, uh, Bavna, uh, for uh, moderating and for, for such great questions. So uh, this is wonderful. I hope we do many more of these. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you all at another Impact Week event this week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.